Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 19, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Welcome to Go Teach All Nations, bringing you Christ's teachings through Australian and international speakers. And here is today's presenter, Malita Fong. I will invite you to bow your heads with me for a word of prayer as we open. Dear Heavenly Father, we've come this morning to learn of you and to understand how much you love us and what you can do for us. Lock us in with you and we thank you for doing this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a cold night. They've just arrested Jesus. The chief priests of Jerusalem captains of the temple, elders and their servants, they've all gathered and they've become a mob. They're carrying torches, swords, clubs. They paid one of his followers to lead them to him. He kissed him as a friend and they arrested him as a criminal. Led him to the high priest's house where they are all now relaxed because they think they've caught him. They think that he is actually who he says he is, the Messiah. And that makes them afraid. Peter is here too. He didn't quite belong um, in this group, or did he? I don't know. Back in Gethsemane, he'd taken a sword out and he'd taken a swipe at one of the high priest's servants. He was trying to defend Jesus and he was a bit successful. He took off his right ear. But Jesus picks up that ear and he puts it back because healing is Jesus' way. Violence is not. All the disciples fled. But he followed after he fled at a safe distance and he ends up in the courtyard of the high priest and he's sitting down rubbing shoulders with the folks who'd just taken his beloved friend, Jesus. Now, you know the story and I know the story. He's sitting there and this young girl, she sees him and she looks at him intently and she says, you were with him. And he says, no, I'm not. I have not been with him. I'm not one of his disciples. They say it again. And as he gets this um, recognition from them, he starts to feel like it's an accusation. And so he defends himself a little bit more vehemently. And on the third recognition, he says, I do not know him. I don't know what you're talking about. As those words left his lips, the rooster crowed. Jesus from the balcony, a little ways away, turns and their eyes meet. And Peter can see his face and he remembers. Ellen White gives us an insight in Desire of Ages, page 713. A tide of memories rushed over him, the Savior's tender mercy, his kindness and long suffering, his gentleness and patience toward his erring disciples, all was remembered. He recalled the caution, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. He reflected in horror upon his own ingratitude, his falsehood, his perjury. And once more he looked at his Savior and saw a sacrilegious hand raised to smite him in the face. He felt sick. These words Jesus had spoken to him just hours before. And you can turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. And it says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go to prison and to death for you. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will crow, will not crow this eve, this day before you will deny three times that you know me. Such a simple test. In these verses, we find the three main players of the great controversy. Can you pick them? It's Satan, it's Christ, and it's us. This conversation happened less than 24 hours before Jesus would die on the cross, before the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, would indeed be slain for the world's sake. On this very night, just a couple hours before, Jesus had washed his disciples' feet, But the impression of humility had faded fast. And like children, the disciples had started squabbling about who's going to be the greatest. Instead of thinking of Jesus and his coming sacrifice, they were busy thinking about themselves. So ironic. In his most selfless acts, 
they were being so selfish. If Andre Roux was about to raise his baton to let the orchestra and the choir sing and make beautiful music, but all of a sudden each one decided that they would have their moment in history, their moment to shine, and started to play their own tune, their own tempo, their own words, how beautiful would that be? It would be a cacophony of noise, and I think he'd love them to just quit it. That must have been how Jesus felt. It was not a beautiful conversation that they, the disciples were having. And I wonder how many times, how many times must Jesus be trying to get through to you and I? But we miss what he's been able saying to us because we're so focused on ourselves, feeding self, feeding our wants, our desires, our feelings. On this night, everyone should have been focused on Jesus, right? but instead they were thinking about self. Yet Jesus chose to stick with them. Jesus chose to stick with these disciples and Jesus chooses to stick by you and I in our selfishness as well. Amen? That is what God's love is like. His ability to believe in you and I is way beyond our ability to believe in Him. Remember in verse 33 how Peter says really loudly and boldly, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. To paraphrase, sounds a little bit like one of our famous tennis players, bring it on. <laughs> but this isn't the attitude. This is not the attitude that you're supposed to have when you're going to battle the devil. In fact, Jesus never asks us to battle the devil on our own. He says, let me battle him. You know why? because we don't see. We don't see and we don't know how weak we actually are. Desire of Ages has a beautiful quote on, on page 673. She says, when Peter said that he would follow his Lord to prison and to death, he meant it, every word, but he did not know himself. Hidden in his heart were elements of evil that circumstances would fan into life. Unless he was made conscious of his danger, those would prove his eternal ruin. You see, the Savior saw in him a self-love, a self-assurance that would overbear even his love for Christ. Does that worry you? Christ's solemn warning was a call to heart searching. Peter needed Peter needed to distrust himself. You can write that down if you're taking notes. He needed to distrust himself. In a day and age when everyone's saying, look within yourself, there's strength within you. It's not so with Jesus. He understands the nature of humanity. He understands you and I. And to have a deeper faith in Christ is what he wants to give us. We don't know the extent of our weakness. Self-satisfied minds, they rest in their self-exaltation. The selfish will always works to save self. A DIY approach will leave you alone in the Christian walk. We need Jesus. You know, my family know a lot of things about me. They know a lot of my weaknesses, and one of them is chips. I used to have them in my room, but you know what? I had a New Year's resolution two years ago, and I no longer have chips in my room. You just might be laughing at that, but the truth is you probably have that same problem. So I have other things in my room. I know more of my weaknesses, but I still fall to temptation. Get this, Jesus knows all about you and I, and yet he stands by us. Now, did Peter love God? Yes. Did he love him a lot? Yes. To say he would go to prison and to death, he was convinced that he was doing something good here for Jesus. He loved Jesus. I have a sister and I feel like I would defend her to the hilt. But it was a Peter syndrome. You see, Jesus didn't need Peter to, to defend him in such a physical way. He didn't need Peter to be like this. Brash and bold, okay. But it was misplaced because he was trusting in self. Peter didn't know what made him up. He didn't realize, like Jesus did, the baggage that he was carrying on the inside. 
Peter didn't know how when the buttons were pushed, how he would react. But Jesus knows our souls and he knew him very well. Never forget that the one who knows you best loves you most. Peter was that disciple who in Luke, when there was an amazing miracle catch of fish, he gets down on his knees in the boat and he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. I don't deserve to even be in the same boat as you. And that's true. And yet this same Peter was used to discourage Jesus from going to the cross. You can read that in Mark 8, 31. Jesus begins to teach his disciples, who's trying to explain to them that he, the Savior, must suffer many things and be rejected and be killed and after three days rise again. Months before Jesus was crucified, he says this, and Peter doesn't like it. And he says, come aside, I got to tell you something, Lord. Don't talk like that. It's not nice. It doesn't sound good. It's, it's uncomfortable and it's scary. Just don't say that. It was a rebuke to Jesus. He took it upon himself to save the reputation of Jesus, to save the reputation of God. He didn't understand. And he was, in a way, trying to be polite and pulling him aside to do this, not to embarrass him in front of the other disciples. But Jesus is very decided in what he does here. You can read it in verse 33. Jesus He turns away from Peter. He's back to him. He faces the disciples and he says, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. You see, Jesus saw that Satan was taking advantage of Peter's weaknesses. He was speaking through Peter. Satan had placed himself between Jesus and Peter. There was something between And Peter had not even recognized this. What was his weakness? What was Peter's weakness? And I'm hearing your answers. It's a little muffled if you could speak up. Ironically, Peter was afraid. Some of you said it, I'm sure, of suffering. Oh, yes, Peter would go to prison and to death in word, but not actually, not at this point in his faith. He was not there yet. He had big things to say, lots of words, but words are cheap. Peter had really thought he would, you know, be self-sacrificing. I'll leave my job. I'll leave my family. I'll put God first in those things. But he didn't know how much suffering was ahead of him. And this is a question I ask myself. How, How did Peter, so overcome by God's love, the next minute become an instrument of the devil to discourage him. Why would Peter not want Jesus to go to the cross? We need a savior. Peter was in denial. He was in, he was the one who denied Jesus. Yes. But before he denied Jesus, he was in denial too. He was in denial of his lack of faith. That's why he denied Jesus. He was in denial of his fear of suffering. That's why he denied the savior. The reason he tried to discourage Jesus from the cross was because the awful implications were just too frightening, too humiliating. Not only for Jesus, but for Peter, for self. And Satan saw his opportunity to topple one of the most vocal disciples and burden Jesus in the process. This is why Jesus said in verse 31 of our Key text in chapter 22 of Luke, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, it's interesting. It's interesting that Jesus calls him Simon. Why not Peter? And Jesus actually does call him Peter twice, or we could say three times. First of all, when he meets him after Andrew's brought him to meet him um, and he gives him this new name, he says, you'll be called Cephas or a stone where we go to Petra and we get Peter. You can look it up. And then secondly, in Matthew 16, 18, he's talking about the church and Peter being part of that. He's got work for him to do, but it's not happening yet. And then thirdly, here in the verse, in verse 34, after he told him that he was going to deny him. Now, Simon in Hebrew refers to hearing or the listener. And the change of his name, I think it was to signal a change of character. As most often times in the Bible, when the name changes, 
the character changes. Something has changed. And such a change would only take place before, not after, sorry, after, not before, Calvary. In the meantime, Peter is very much needing to be the listener, to listen carefully to Jesus. Like Samuel, Samuel was called twice, Simon was called twice, and indeed he needed to listen. And Jesus was specifically trying to get his attention here because the devil was about to sift him like wheat. Now, sifting wheat and other grains, it's a process of separating what you don't need from what you want. You want the grain of wheat, but you don't need the stalk, the grass, all of this stuff. And so it is a point of shaking. You put something in this with holes and what you want is falling through and what you don't want stays on the top. That's with grain. So in other words, Peter would be shaken thoroughly through and through. He was going to experience an internal agitation that would challenge his faith to the verge of overthrow. What was true was going to come through and what was not was going to be cut out. Why Simon? Why not James or John, Thomas, Thaddeus, all the other ones we don't really hear so much about? Why not them? You see, when Satan has asked or demanded for you, when it says that the you in the Greek is plural, and it actually referred to all of the disciples, Satan has asked for all of you, and indeed they all fled. But as far as the other disciples were concerned, listening to Jesus talk to Simon, they all thought that Simon was the disciple. Remember how a few weeks after his resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, Jesus appears to the disciples, and as soon as Peter sees him, as soon as he sees him, he has to dive into the water and swim over to Jesus. It's not a long distance. The Bible says it was a short distance. I think that's John's gospel. And remember when Peter is walking, sorry, when Peter sees Jesus walking on water, he says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you and I will. And I think if I was part of the disciples there, I would have been like, whoa, I wish that I had thought of that. Like, I wish I had the faith to say, call me, I'm coming. I want to walk on water. That would have been so cool. What a lot of faith. Peter is so spiritual and on fire. Satan looks at this and he says, I want that one. If I could have any of them, I'd like that one. Because if I get that one, I get 10. I get 10 others. I get all of the disciples. I can discourage the lot. Peter had openly said in John 6, when many people were walking away from Jesus, he said, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? You are the man. We want to stick by you. But I tell you what, sticking by Jesus means going through what comes to Jesus. And that's not a scary thought because you're with Jesus. If you've ever ridden on your dad's back or somebody's back in a pool when you're a kid and they start diving through the water, you have to hold on for dear life because this is the ride. You're going on it. You have to go under the water with them. We have to go through with Jesus if we want to stick by him. It was Peter who had dared to walk on the water toward Jesus. But the Peter that even Peter thought he knew was different to the Peter when being sifted. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. Satan's strategy was an old military tactic. Divide and conquer. Find the weakest point and exploit it. Put all your pressure there and let's bust it. The thing is, I think like Peter, I have multiple weak spots. And so this could be quite a watershed experience. When leadership is vulnerable all the better for the enemy. But when leaders fall, sorry, when, when, uh, when non-leaders fall, leaders do get discouraged, but they don't get so discouraged. But when a leader falls, everybody gets discouraged. I heard a pastor's marriage that broke up and one of the youth said to me, if the pastor can't hold it together, what hope is there for the rest of us? And she was serious. But I want to tell you this, the pastor is not Jesus. Amen? We must look to Jesus. You see, Moses was made the target of impatience at the end of 40 years in the wilderness when he struck the rock to discourage the people who were ready to go into the promised land. David was made the target of lust 
and, of, and a lack of self-control with Bathsheba. Why? To discourage Israel in the height of her power. Peter was made the target of self-preservation and denial when Christ was in trial to discourage the early church in the beginning of its journey. Peter fell because he didn't know he was so weak. He thought he was strong. So how do we find out? How do we find out who we really are, our weaknesses and what sin really lurks in our hearts? Do we even want to know? <laughs> yes, we do. We've got to take that rug <clears throat> off the floor. We need to know because... This is very important. We need to know because it is separating you and I from God. And it is weakening our defense against the great tempter, the serpent of old Satan. This is something that our friends will never be able to tell us. Only God can tell us. And he tells us when, when we are close to him. If you aren't close to Jesus, there's a whole reality that passes us by. There's a whole spiritual battle that we don't see. And this is what happened with Peter. That is why he fell. Have a look with me at verse 54 of Luke 22. We pick up the story again. Having arrested Jesus, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled the fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him and sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with Jesus. But he denied, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then another, about an hour later, says confidently to him, Surely this man also is with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows, You will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. I am, in a way, very glad I wasn't there to see that, because when you see a man weep and then bitterly, this is painful. And I can just imagine, you would think this would be the end of this disciple. Snuffed out, done. But it's not. Amen? It's not. And for Satan's one strategy of attack used here, he's got many. Jesus responds with three of his own. And let's think about it. Jesus told Peter that Satan was coming to sift him like wheat, ready or not. Satan's strategy is to shake you up, to take every fiber of your being to test them and test all your weak points. But in verse 32, it begins with this word. And because Jesus says it, it is a divine conjunction because it's a conjunction word. But when Jesus steps into your life, there is a divine conjunction. Do you want to change your life today? Invite him in. Things will change. It was a divine change that happened when Jesus stepped under Zacchaeus' sycamore branch by Mary Magdalene in her street trial, by the Samaritan woman at the well, and to the chief, the thief, sorry, on the cross next to Jesus. And when Jesus comes again, it's going to be the biggest change our world has ever seen. Things are going to change and they're going to become made new. But Jesus wants to do a new work and new thing in you and I before that day comes. Have you asked him in? Or have you let him stay outside gently knocking? Is he in your heart? Is he in your life? Can people look at you and intently and come to the conclusion that you have been with Jesus? They, really, they recognize you as being somebody who has followed Jesus, who looks like him in action and in character, who sounds like him in word and in deed. Are they accusing you of this? But back to our story. Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. But number one. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Two, when you have returned to me, when you have returned, being a future tense, Jesus has faith and assurance that you can come back. It's not a long road. 
not a long road and strengthen your brethren. So I have prayed for you. When you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Jesus has work for you and I to do. He wants to restore you. And I think that's beautiful. It sounds just like the prodigal son. That's three to one. Jesus is telling Peter, Satan's out to destroy you. And perhaps you feel like he is out to destroy you even today. Maybe the trials that you've been facing at work or in your family, in your marriage, at school, they are just out to destroy you. You feel like someone is against you. But I want you to know today that Jesus is for you. Write it down if you're taking notes. Jesus is for you helping you to endure the fiery darts of the wicked one. Jesus says, I have prayed for you. It's past tense. I've already made provision for you to win this. Victory was assured and available to Peter. On Jesus' end, there was no kink, but on Peter's end of the hose, there was a big kink. He didn't think he needed to unkink anything, change anything. Jesus had interceded on Peter's half ahead of time. Jesus' weapon of choice, it fits the battle. And this is not a fist fight, so put your weapons down. It's a spiritual battle, and a spiritual battle requires spiritual weapons. What is Jesus' weapon of choice? It's prayer. Prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse. Peter was ready for a physical battle. He had a sword. I don't know why. Apparently there was two in the group. A bit shocking. But Jesus says, that is not my way. Prayer is my way. Reliance on Jesus. Peter met the trial with an attitude, a selfish attitude. I can do it. Let's see what I've got. I've got a sword. Let's pull it out. But Jesus says, no, surrender it to Jesus because it is a what? A spiritual battle. If Peter had met the trial with the same attitude and the same weapons that Jesus had met it with on his behalf, it would have been a different ending. In a way, I'm glad that we get to go through Peter's uh, growth so that we can see how we too can come through the trial. What weapon are you using? Jesus had said minutes before to his disciples, awake and pray lest you fall into temptation. But they'd slumbered and slept, ready to trust the arm of flesh, but not the mighty right arm of God. Jesus doesn't say that he's prayed that Peter won't have the trial. He hasn't said that he, he prayed that he won't have any temptation. How many times do we pray? Lord, take it away. I just can't deal with it. It's like we can't see that this spiritual battle is going on. Jesus wants us to pray for strength, not no trial. We pray, Lord, take this problem away. Get this burden off my back. Jesus wants us to pray for stronger backs to endure until the end. He prays that Peter's faith may not fail this coming trial. God has to answer that prayer because he says, pray for it. So let's pray for this. Faith is a prized commodity in the great controversy. Faith is being sifted here. Satan doesn't have, have any use for your faith. He would just discard it. But Jesus does. You know why? Because when you put your trust in somebody, it creates a relationship. And Jesus is longing for you and I to trust him implicitly. There are so many promises in God's word that if we would but trust him, he could release this blessing in our lives. Peter, just quickly, if we could jump to Peter on the water when he is out of the boat and is sinking right next to the Savior, if he could have done that now. He cries out, Lord, save me. It was a good prayer, one that we should not forget because we're going to need it often. And in that moment, Jesus caught him by the hand and he lifted him up. You can sink really fast in water, but that's it. You don't have to have heaps of faith. You just need to put it in Jesus. It doesn't matter how much you've got. It just matters where you've put it. Have you put your faith in Jesus? Let's put our faith in Jesus today. Unlike his watery trial, Peter had not realized the danger of his weakness this night. But he was sinking. Faith is a muscle and it needs resistance to grow. He believed in gain with no pain. 
And like the gymming membership you probably have that you're paying for and you don't even use, I know it's not all of you, but I have friends who do that. He wasn't willing to do the hard yards. He wasn't willing to get involved in this. He wanted to appear like he had it. And he didn't realize, he didn't realize that he wasn't engaged in Jesus. He wasn't fully trusting. And he thought he'd sacrificed enough already. Desire of Ages, page 416, has this insight. The disciple shrank from fellowship with his Lord in suffering. But in the heat of the furnace fire, he was to learn its blessing. Peter wanted glory, not sorrow. Are we ready to trust Jesus in sorrow? When Peter, James and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration, seeing the divine glory of Jesus, those mighty prophets, Moses, Elijah, all was glory, all was joy. Peter was so enwrapped with this picture that he dared to interrupt the moment by saying, hey, guys, I've got a great idea. We should make a monument to each of these guys. He missed the entire point. This was to encourage Jesus on his way to Calvary to make the ultimate sacrifice. Peter didn't want to see that. It's suffering. Surrender is suffering, he says. God the Father himself had to interrupt him and he says, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. And he might have well added Simon. Jesus must have spent many nights praying for his disciples. But you know what? That prayer that he prayed for Peter, he prays it for you and I. Jesus' prayer is specific. He doesn't pray that the trials go away. Instead, he asks for more strength to help us endure the trial. God likes this faith muscle. How is your faith muscle? When Satan comes to discourage you, Jesus is ready to encourage you. When Satan comes to discourage you, Jesus is ready to encourage you. If for every temptation that Satan has devised, Jesus has already been tested with it. And he overcame. And his faith didn't fail, Hebrews 4.15. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Amen. He's prayed for you. Victory is available. He believes in you that you can return to him because he's made the way so clear. He will restore you. He has a purpose for your life and he's made provision for your salvation at every trial, every trial. We come back to Peter, our lookalike in the courtyard, unable to endure the scene. He rushed heartbroken from the hall. Peter is converted after the denial. He can finally see himself. He's filled with repentance and he is converted. Ellen White writes in the book of Education, page 89, she writes, When in the judgment hall the words of denial had been spoken, when Peter's love and loyalty awakened under the Savior's glance of pity and love and sorrow, he sent him forth to the garden where Christ had wept and prayed. When his tears of remorse dropped upon the sod that had been moistened with the blood drops of his agony, then the Savior's words, I have prayed for thee. When thou, when thou art converted, strengthen your brethren. Were a stay to his soul. Christ, though foreseeing his sin, had not abandoned him to despair. You can imagine if the look of Jesus in the, in the court that Peter saw in the courtyard, if that had been anything harsh. And you think about how you look at your family and if you want to convey a message, we kind of body language is making up the most of your communication, not the words. So think about that. And I wish you didn't have to look at my face now. <laughs> but if the look had had any condemnation, Peter would have been utterly distraught. He felt, it says that there in the very same ground he had seen Jesus praying, Peter fell down in agony. He's now praying and he is 
weeping bitterly. In fact, he wished that he might die. That's how low Peter felt. I want to tell you something that's very simple. Peter, his experience tells us of a man who really wanted to defend Jesus. He wanted to be there for Jesus. He wanted to do the best by Jesus, but he didn't understand what Jesus was on about. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The very fact that we need to swap lives says ours is not good. We need to give our hearts to God. But the devil will work very hard, but not as hard as Jesus, because Jesus worked very, very hard to save us. But he will work very hard to try and discourage every time that you want to stop and look up and listen to Jesus. He will discourage you. He'll make you tired so that you sleep when you should pray. He will make you foolish so that you really look back and just get discouraged looking at all the bad things you've done. And sure, Satan's got a great memory. He remembers everything you've done and he can tell you verbatim. He can tell you about the look in your face and the thoughts in your heart and discourage you. But Jesus looks at you and I today and he says, I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you. And when you return to me, though you fall, get up and return to me. When you return to me, I have something for you to do. I want you to strengthen your brethren. Use your experience to encourage someone else to look up to Jesus today. When Satan comes to discourage, Jesus is ready to encourage you. Jesus has already prayed for you. He believes in you and he has a plan to restore you. Friend, I want to make this appeal to you because Peter comes to, we go to Acts and you can see him, he's all over it. Jesus is living in this man now. He is a converted sinner. Amen. You see Peter preaching, Acts 2. Guess what? He sounds like Jesus. In Acts 3, he is healing. He is giving out all that he has. He's giving only Jesus. He says, I don't have anything else. I don't have any money to this, to this guy who wants healing. He says, but I give you Jesus. Get up and walk. In Acts 4, people are likening him to being just like Jesus. And in Acts 5, verse 41, Peter has been released from prison. He did go. There was suffering. And he is rejoicing to have been counted worthy to suffer shame in Jesus name we're not home yet but when we do I want to hear Jesus say to me my child thank you for trusting me that is what Jesus is asking his servants to do to trust him and to be faithful not to trust self but to distrust self and simply cast your faith on the side of Christ saying, Lord, save me. Is that your desire today to put your trust in Jesus, to put your faith in him, to put your hand in his hand? If it is, I want to encourage you to make that decision firm today and get down on your knees as we pray. Commit yourself to him. I want to trust Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so weak. We're not able to, to even solve some of life's simplest problems because we can't handle, can't handle self. We fall so many times to the temptations that Satan throws our way. And sometimes he doesn't even have to work hard to get us. We're just so blind to our own need of you. But I want to thank you. I want to thank you that you change everything, that you have prayed for us, that you have seen the way that we can come back to us, back to you, sorry, and that you have a work for us to do. You want to restore us. The Heavenly Father, lock us in with you, not just for this moment of time where we listen to your word, but lock us in with you for life. We want to put our trust in Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This message was made available by the Watara Seventh-day Adventist Church. For more resources like this, visit waitarachurch.org.au. Marley Defong sang, He Will Hold Me Fast. 
And coming up next, Ben Everson will sing Praise Ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise him, for he is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to his temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration, adoration. of his mercy did shave Welcome to Answers to the Big Questions. I'm your host, Alan Sonter, and I'm glad you could join me today. In the first two episodes, I focused on God, evidence for his existence and what he is like. But as we look at the world around us, we see much that does not reflect what a good God would do. Where did these discordant elements come from? I believe they came from an enemy, often called Satan, who hates God and wants to destroy what God has made. So the question I will try to answer in this episode is, who is Satan? The answer to this question starts a long way back. God has always lived, so no doubt he started creating living things millions of years ago. The Bible tells us that God is surrounded by millions of angels who are happy to do anything he asks them to do. But we also get a picture of a rebel angel whose name, before he became a rebel, was Shining One, better known to many as Lucifer. The Bible indicates that he was the leader of all the other angels, but he disagreed with the way God was running the universe and wanted to do things his own way. A symbolic description of the situation given by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 14 and verses 12 to 14 indicates that Lucifer became so ambitious that he wanted to take God's place. Apparently, he went around seeking support from the angels. And Revelation 12 verse 4 indicates that about a third of the angels were prepared to follow him. The Apostle John Writing in chapter 12, verse 7 of the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, tells us that as a result of Lucifer's rebellion, there was war in heaven, the place where God lives. Lucifer, who became known as Satan, meaning the accuser or adversary, supported by the angels who accepted his leadership, fought against God, but he was defeated and thrown out of heaven. He came with his angels down to this earth, which seems to have been created not long before. 
he determined that he would set up his own kingdom on this earth to demonstrate that his system of government was better than God's. To accomplish his aim, the first thing he had to do was to get human beings to accept his leadership in place of God's. Now, let's change the scene for a moment. God's final act when he created all living things on this earth was to make humans. He created one man, Adam, and one woman, Eve, and he told them to populate the earth. He made a beautiful garden called Eden for them to live in and warned them about Satan, telling them not to eat the fruit of one particular tree in the garden. He said that if they ate that fruit, they would eventually die. He wanted Adam and Eve to trust him to know what was best for them. And the simple test of their trust would be their obedience to his command not to eat from that tree. Now we return to Satan and his activities again. Soon after creation, before any children were born to Adam and Eve, Satan came into the garden and by lying to Eve about the fruit of that tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he tricked her into eating the fruit. He told Eve that she would not die if she ate it, and she believed his lie and ate the fruit. She then gave some of the fruit to Adam, and he ate it too. By eating the fruit, Adam and Eve showed that they were willing to obey Satan rather than God. So Satan claimed the world as his domain. He said that humans had accepted him as their ruler, so he should be free to try out his form of government here. All the created beings in the universe were perplexed about whether Satan or God was right. Although most of them did not join Satan in his rebellion, they had heard his claims that God was overbearing and dictatorial and that he had not treated Satan fairly, and they were puzzled. They had never heard lies before, so didn't know what to make of Satan's accusations against God. So when humans believed Satan and disobeyed God, all the loyal angels and other created beings in the universe watched to see what God would do. If he destroyed Adam and Eve, they might have continued to obey him, but out of fear rather than love. Because God was a loving and honest God, he didn't want to force his created beings to obey him from fear, and he had decided to give them genuine free will so they could decide for themselves whether they would accept his rulership. That's why he had put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden in the first place. So when Adam and Eve chose to listen to Satan instead of God, God didn't force them to obey him. He allowed Satan to try out his form of government here on this earth as he wanted to. There's an interesting account of some of the interaction between God and Satan in the book of Job in the Bible. When Adam and Eve realized what the result of their disobedience really was, they were sorry and tried to obey God again. But the damage had been done and they had developed a weakened nature so that they couldn't stand up against Satan by themselves and they were condemned to die for disobeying God. As time passed, Adam and Eve had children, and the people multiplied on the earth, but they eventually died, just as God said they would. All Adam and Eve's descendants, and we're among them, have a weakened, sinful human nature, so we can't escape Satan's control by ourselves. And we'll all eventually die unless we choose to accept God's solution to our problem. Because God still respects our freedom of choice, when we want God to be our ruler rather than Satan, God will step in when we ask him to and put limits on what Satan can do. It's only because God does this that any of us can escape the control of Satan. Way back before the creation of the world, God and his son, whose name was originally Michael but who is better known to us now as Jesus Christ, had worked out a plan to deal with the rebellion, should it arise. Under this plan, sometimes called the plan of salvation, God's Son was to come to this earth as a human being 
and was to live just as we live here, but without in any way accepting Satan's rulership or obeying him by sinning. Sin is obeying Satan rather than God. He knew that Satan would try desperately to get him to accept his rule, and he decided that he would allow Satan to kill him rather than for him to accept Satan's rule. The death that he died would be special in that it would be accepted by God in place of the death of any people who chose to accept God's rulership rather than Satan's. Only by accepting Jesus as their saviour could human beings escape from the death that would result from accepting Satan as ruler. Satan has been busy for several thousand years now trying to establish his control of this earth and trying to prove that his system, based on pride, selfishness and coercion, is better than God's, based on love and freedom. The loyal angels have watched what has happened and they can see that God's way is best. So the time will soon come when God says that Satan's experiment has gone on long enough and he will put an end to Satan and his evil angels who help him in his work. Unfortunately, people who have chosen to live by Satan's principles will then have to die as God originally said they would. So, who is Satan? Satan is the rebellious angel, the shining one, or Lucifer, who has been trying to take control of this world in defiance of the God who created the world and every other living thing including Lucifer himself and all the angels who side with him. Is God then responsible for what Lucifer has become and therefore for all the suffering that has resulted from Satan's activities? No, God did not create Satan. He created the shining one, Lucifer, the beautiful leading angel. But he gave Lucifer free will and Lucifer misused that freedom and his pride led him to become the rebel. Satan. There's always a risk that any individual who has free will might misuse it. But would we rather, therefore, be simply robots who can't think and choose for ourselves? I think not. We should thank God for the freedom of choice he has given us, and thank him too for the plan of salvation that makes possible a way of escape for us from the mess that Satan has got us into. In this presentation, I mentioned that God told Adam and Eve that if they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would eventually die. Death is, to most of us, an enemy that we don't like to meet. But what really is death? This is a big question that many people ask. In the next presentation, I will answer the question, what is death? And you'll see that there are two kinds of death. This answer is one you really should not miss. You've been listening to Answers to the Big Questions. I'm Alan Sonta, and I hope you can join me next time. You've been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.